This is Fragmented Reality, a digital bulletin podcast designed to bust the buzzwords that dominate enterprise technology. My name is Ben Mouncer, and in this episode I take my clutch of eggs, each containing an industry buzzword, to Sanjeev Mathur, a managing director in the energy, chemicals and utilities practice for Accenture. Okay, Sanjeev, if we crack open our first sure. buzzword, it's gone for a blue egg. Okay. Um, what do we have? DevOps. DevOps. Okay. What does what does DevOps mean to you? So how do you define DevOps? How do you define DevOps? Um, DevOps means development and operations in a much more, let's say, quick and um, faster way. Yeah. Um, and so you don't have like this kind of developing a product first and then checking over the, over the fence to an, an operations guy. We actually do have a team of people who actually get to build mm-hmm. uh, together. Do you see successful sort of DevOps strategies where, uh, when you go about your work? Do you see DevOps in action quite a lot? I would say it's in action for certain types of work, yeah. um, not for everything. Um, so it is getting into more and more prevalence in terms of, you know, these new packages which are coming in, right, which yeah. are essentially like uh, evergreen packages where you, you know, host it on the cloud, um, have kind of, you know, really easy to, to kind of develop on and then and maintain. So those kind of packages are getting much, much more prevalence. Um, but I definitely see it's more and more of like a client, a client want to do more of this mm-hmm. as they go forward. Yeah. Um, but I think from my perspective, it's it's actually, um, I would say, it's not mainstream, mainstream yet. It's it's at least in utilities. Uh, some utilities are more advanced than others, but I think it's much more, let's say, common in some of the other industries, mm-hmm. like you know, banking or uh, communications, high tech, and so on. Do you see it becoming more and more popular in industries where at the moment it might not be so popular? I think so, yeah. yeah. Because I think the key advantage of that, of this this mode of operation, is that you're basically moving to a, to a land where you don't do like a big bang kind of three-year mega transformation programs where you develop something and then three years later you're going to show it to the business and the business doesn't like it. This whole point of this is like you, know, you have... You, you're not going to develop things which are going to be heavily customized. You're going to take things which are going to be probably up mostly out of the, out, 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 off the shelf. You might want to do some initial kind of um, potentially a waterfall agile hybrid type of development. But then once you've got a decent amount of product which works basically, then you want to give it into a DevOps where you quickly engage the business in very short cycles. Because I think the world is moving on in terms of speed of value to be delivered to the businesses. Yeah. And I think this is kind of where I see more and more, you know, every industry is going to have much, much more, let's say, pressure on them to kind of respond to the markets much faster than what they used to be. And I think this is, this is a good technique to do that. Um, there are some key prerequisites, though, to actually make this successful. Yeah, so basically you see it being critical in a future where development has, people are going to have to, companies are going to have to develop really quickly and in an agile way as well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think and, and do it in a kind of a do, kind of revise and then do again kind of mode, mode of operation in a much, much more quicker time frame. But also that kind of also gives you a chance to test things. And if it's not working, stop things. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. otherwise you're, you're just too late. Really good. Right. Should we go for our second egg, sure. Sanjeev? Okay. Going for a yellow, yellow. one. Yep. Yeah. Cool. It's cracking the egg open there. Good. What's this? The next oh, one. digital disruption. Digital disruption. Okay, that's. A I like. I like talking about this because um, I think I feel like this is a phrase that maybe is misused sometimes, overused. Perhaps yes, I to agree. talk about. Yeah. So yeah, do you want to talk about that and, and why you feel it is like that? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, overall, if you think about it, right, digital has generally disrupted certain industries, right? If I look back at the first time when this old e-commerce thing came up, when I was still very you know young in terms of uh, my career uh, 2000 early 2000s i mean you know people were talking about like it's going to completely take over, impact retail you know it's going to be and i'm like oh yeah it is going to disrupt it but didn't really think it's going to happen as uh, as it has happened so it has really generally if you look at Naha street retail it's at a really significant pressure now because quite a lot of the digital is done online mm-hmm. right and uh, you know you only go to the supermarkets to do your you know food shopping which you need right I mean everything from clothes and everything else you could potentially could, could buy uh, online so I think it has genuinely disrupted industries there's no way about it but it's also overhyped in many other other ways right yeah. so for example you know people have kind of come up with a new app 
for a particular, let's say, you know, retail process. Let's say in a utility industry, it could be people have, have seen many of my clients develop a new fancy app. But actually, that has not reduced any calls. In fact, it has increased the number of calls because people are just going to the app for a particular thing. It is not end-to-end, -end, so they just stop that and then call. So I think the real challenge has been that, you know, whilst it has got a potential of end-to-end -end genuine disruption, I don't think so many industries have actually fully re realized the value of that digital disruption because they have not been able to end-to-end -end transform things. They've had pockets of it. Uh, but it hasn't really genuinely dri delivered like you know significant amount of savings. Having said that, I think there is a potential to do that, yeah. uh, but that requires kind of proper end-to-end -end business process, business people transformation. Disruption, not, disruption not is quite a hard thing to achieve, isn't it? Because <laughs> yeah, the, the definition of disruption is that it's a, a complete overhaul of something, yeah. not just not just iterative change, but a complete complete, complete change. And actually. Yeah. A lot of, uh, uh, in my view, I don't, uh, and I don't. You seem to share this view, is that um, when people talk about digital disruption, they're they're misusing it as a substitute for basic digital sort of change and digital initiatives. Is that is that sort of what you're saying? I think quite a lot of the stuff is, as I said, I mean, I always think like there are, you know, there's what we call like um, business business process improvement. Yeah. And I think digital will improve the number of processes, and I think that should not be kind of viewed as a digital disruption from my perspective. Having said that, there are certain as I said, certain industries and certain business models which are generally going to disrupt, right? I mean, retail is a classic example where I yeah. think, you know, it has genuinely disrupted, you know, people's business models. Do you think part of it is that business leaders want to be seen to be doing a lot of work in technology and digital, so therefore the language they use is maybe a bit more hyped up than it normally would be? Um, I think, I think it's partly true um, that they want to make sure that it's kind of a, it's it's a bit more let's say, rally the troops. They want to make it a bigger bigger deal of it uh, than it is really. But I think, uh, but but as I said to you, right, in some areas it has genuinely disrupted as well. So I think they're also fearful that it should not happen to us. Like I mean, I, I mean, I work quite a lot with the utilities, retail businesses, and and if you look at the utilities retail businesses in the UK, they are genuinely digitally disrupted, because they were like you know as you probably know six big players, and and it's not just digital which has been disrupted that. It's also the regulation has contributed to that. But currently, as you look at the market today. You know, every every CEO in the, in the retail business is scratching their heads and thinking about how to respond to that. Um, they want to come up with a completely new digital attacker type business model, which is really really low cost to serve. But the challenge they have is they have lev they're left with this legacy base, and there are other companies like Octopus and, and Ovo which are coming with a complete digital base because ultimately it was a retail business. And if you had a completely new kind of digital stack, which is significantly low cost to serve, that is general disruption. But it doesn't happen in every industry, right? And I think that, that's why I think the CEOs are probably need to take like a bit more critical look in terms of which industry they're talking about and, and, and what is the potential of disruption. But in general, it has impacted most industries, but not disrupted everything. Yeah, yeah. Is disruption a word that Accenture uses as a company? Do you talk about digital disruption? We talk about disruption yeah. as well. Uh, we, we use the word compressive dis disruption rather than, a, let's say, overnight disruption. So the, the, the compressive disruption, the, the disruption is when things start to change on the sides. You don't realize it, but it's actually changing your business model, right? So slowly but surely, you can start to see that, you know, chunks of your business is actually being disrupted and then suddenly you realize one finder that actually it has completely been disrupted so I think it's that kind of language we talk about and that's why we, we talk about um, we call about pivoting, pivoting to the future which is kind of a way to think about how do you move from a current business to a future digital business but do it in a way which doesn't kind of completely kill your uh, current business because if you do too fast uh, to the new business you probably you know Kill your, kill your current business uh, and you invest so much on the future business uh, but if you don't invest enough in the, in the current business and you are too slow then you are you're also at risk so it's all about you know compressive disruption but then think about we, we talk about three or four things to do that right so yeah. one of them is about you know um, obviously using digital to reduce cost because every business as I said has that potential right to do that second is growing the core so in certain areas of your business you can actually use digital to grow more and then the third one for us is basically quite interesting, which is kind of the wise pivot, as we call it, which is about how do you actually make decisions where you can invest appropriately in old and the new? Because you, don't, you, you, know, you have to be really balanced about that, right? And then finally is the scaling the new, right? So, so you, you scale the new part of it. But I think, as I said, this is a st standard kind of way we think about talking to men companies. And I think it's a, it's a very thoughtful way of thinking about it because it's not like putting all your eggs into the new basket. It's actually trying to reduce cost in the core, 
which I think digital offers a lot of potential. It's not fully disruptive, but it's reducing cost, right? Yeah. Which gives you the free cash flow to invest in in the new. Yeah. Really interesting topic that I think. Should we move on to our yeah, third sure. uh, third egg? Okay, I'll take pink Let's this take time. Take a pink one this time. I've had yellow, blue, now pink. Okay. The next one. Omni channel. Yeah. <laughs> a raise of the eyebrows from Sanjeev. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What do you think? What I'm do you just think? Trying to think about my last experience of Omni Channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, is it is it a word you don't? Is it a phrase you don't hear anymore? Is it kind of old hat? Um, it's a it's it's kind of it it's, it depends on um, it's an old hat, but it, I don't see the companies have still done it. Yeah. <laughs> is the kind of my experience of it, right? So I mean, if I if I think about it, um, many of my clients or even like what I use right if I go to um, um, do something a, a, a particular transaction or whatever in a in a in, a, in a, an email and then a, or a kind of a web-based thing and then I call my um, provider on the call center immediately afterwards how often is that kind of linked um, you know sometimes you have to start again many times I have to still start again yeah and so whilst my expectation is to be completely omnichannel so if I can move from one channel to the other uh, whether I pick up the conversation on the phone to kind of web to you know call center, uh, expectation wise, I think that's what I think of what it should look like, and I think some companies like Amazon others potentially do offer that. Uh, Amazon you can't get to call center anyway, so it's only yeah. one channel. But some companies do offer that. Um, having said that, I think quite a lot of the companies are still struggling with that omni-channel experience. I'm talking about utilities in general, yeah. and they don't have that right. I mean, why do you think that is? Because I think it requires a probably quite a lot of thought through process in reengineering and pro- pro, you know integration of everything, right? In terms of, I mean, I know f- companies like water companies even like you know have got a very different experience on uh, on the call center versus the web for a home move process, and you know and, and be- it is because they haven't joined the dots themselves in terms of thinking about like you know, what the end to end customer journey should look like and where are they falling through. And some other interesting work we have done with clients and on this topic is looking at analytics, customer journey analytics which is looking at end-to-end where the customer starts across all the channels and then finishes like an end-to-end transaction because the customer started on the phone sorry started on the web couldn't get it to some place and then went to the to the to the phone and then had to start again and yeah. then then they were asked to do something else in, on a, in the letter afterwards whatever it might be looking at the end-to-end journey and then figuring out the fallouts and figuring out where the customers are actually falling through and then you find out that you know quite a lot of good insights about how customers end-to-end are not getting the end you know, service yeah. and and that kind of insight is then but that's good to have insight but then the real challenge is how to execute on it and that's where I think our clients are struggling with because they've done a bit of digital disruption like a good few apps or a good kind of but they're still left with legacy systems in the back end they still have to integrate those processes they still have to make sure that the the data behind it kind of hangs together as well and so that is the real challenge which we find our clients facing around this omnichannel topic mm. it seems like omnichannel and talk of like multi-channel has been around for quite a while but as you've said there it's we've still not reached a point where and I, th- I think especially in industries like utilities where customer service is absolutely critical isn't it you you'd like to think that w- there is going to be a future where customers are able to or you know w- companies are going to be able to give customers a, a, a sort of single source of truth around this stuff yeah and i think as i said some of the smaller niche players coming in right i mean with, with the kind of uh, let's say less um, complicated legacy landscape yeah. are able to offer that much more than others right um uh, like for example i mean i'm um, you know, you're utilizing electricity from a new supplier recently, and that has been much, much more, you know, better experience because you know they have got, they don't have all that kind of uh, hodgepodge of back office systems and yeah. uh, systems. So that's e- that makes it a bit easier. Um, starting from a complete new stack. Great, cool. Let's move on to one more <laughs> green one this time. Green one. <coughs> that was a bit more exciting. Oh, big data. Big data. Ooh, okay. okay. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's another hyped up thing, right? Do you think people? Um, really understand what big data is and how how do you separate big data from just normal data analytics and data work like do you think big data is falsely presented sometimes so i think for me the big data is basically looking at um a data set by itself like having a significant amount of volumes um and then uh, you have algorithms which actually mine that big data with with insights which you generally don't see from a human you know, extrapolation or be, be hypothesis-driven analysis, right? So that's for me is a big data. Just generally taking significant amount of data sets. So, for example, the recently the uh, 
some of the work which has been done by Google around breast cancer um, is kind of looking at like predicting breast cancer better than doctors can do and that's kind of taking rims and rims of significant amount of data and then correlating that to actual patients but then you can do that through the inbuilt algorithms which are working on that kind of huge data sets right rather than what I call like you know normal data analysis like you know taking a sample or you're taking a bit of uh, a, a smaller data set, a data set, and then you're probably looking at hypotheses, and you're trying to figure out like whether it's, it's right. Or is it, does that make sense? Yeah, what yeah. I'm trying to say. So I think yeah. that's what I think about generally big data, but um, I don't see that again. Um, it's kind of becoming more pervasive, but it's still not my kind of experience of my clients. Yeah. They can do with like a, a lot of value add with small data before they yeah. go to big data, <laughs> um, because they still have they're not utilizing the data they have. Yeah. And so, you know, even taking the data they have and putting that together and making some analysis around that and hypothesis-driven can get some good insights and then acting on it. Big data is the next level, yeah. which I think, um, you know, they should go and think about. The Do you think cases. it's dependent on the development of technologies like artificial intelligence and, and, you know, machine learning, those kind of technologies which will marry with the kind of data sets that you're talking about, huge data sets? Exactly, and I think yeah, I, I, that, that's right. And so, I mean, like in the case of water industries, for example, yeah. You know, the sensor data from all these different kind of pipes and everything else, you know, that's kind of volume of data coming in. But you can take those that data set, but then you have to put, like, algorithms on it, with machine learning and, and those things to actually then make sense of it. And then you need to execute all that data as well, which is the, the other part of it. So I think, yeah, I think it's a question of getting those technologies matured, uh, which are actually going to do something meaningful with those uh, those data sets. I think they're maturing quite fast, actually. Uh, with, if, you, if you think about like what, what people have been able to do like with Google, with the data sets, they've been, they've been really pioneering that. And some of these platforms, like Google Analytics Platform and uh, you know Amazon kind of Analytics Platform, these, these are coming with modules which are actually already built in for some of those technologies, like you know, machine learning comes built in, so you need to probably utilize that rather than building from scratch. But So these are, these are moving quite fast. Um, but I think I don't see a pervasive use yet of these technologies in, in, the, in the business use cases, but I think they're, they're going to come in the next few years. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned a minute ago, that, that companies are still struggling with small data sets. Why, why do you think that is? Do you think it's a lack of, sort of skills in this area, a lack of technology to support um, data work? I think, think it's less it? technology. It's actually more about um, skills. Uh, I mean, to really get proper data scientists is a difficult task, and, and, and for some of the companies to attract them is very difficult. I mean, we, as a business, because we are a big company, we, we, we have a significant amount of data scientists which we have in different centers of excellence. So we have one in kind of Athens, uh, one in uh, you know Greece and that different places, but we can actually have a career path for these guys. But if you kind of get in them to a smaller company uh, with like, you know, 10, 20, 30 people, you know, they, they don't simulate, they, they, they're quite high in demand, so they, they move on. So skill is one of the things. The other thing, which is the biggest topic, which I think I found in, in many, of my, many of my clients, is that people try to solve the whole world in one go. So they want to take all the data into, into a data, data lake or a data warehouse, and by the time they do that, it's three years, and they haven't delivered any value to the business, and I've seen projects being closed because of that. Yeah, so I think the, uh, the challenge is basically a value-based approach. So what I mean by value-based approach is what we have found with clients is you take a value case, right? Debt or revenue leakage or whatever it might be, uh, customer churn. What is the problem for the business is having? And then try to extract a bunch of data to solve that problem. Get the business engaged, get business some value, and then move to the next use case and the next use case and the next use case before, rather than just taking all data to be kind of put into a common system, all data to be cleaned. Because that just takes a long, long, long time to do it, and I think that's where I think our clients are struggling with. I mean, they don't have very good governance around data, right? I mean, some of the clients I have, like utilities, don't even have a basic handle on, on customer records, customer email addresses, phone numbers, things like that. So you, know, you forget about big data. It's like you know, even the small data is not there, or their um, data in call centers is in, in in free format. So really, getting some fuzzy logic to actually make sense of it. it all those things are pretty the basic steps to do. Pick your use cases, value cases, get some you know, traction with the business, and then you build from that. I've seen a lot of companies trying to go for this big data, data lakes, and, and they have actually failed. Um, so unless you uh, you can have a vision of data lake, and you can and, and some of these platforms are now providing capabilities which you are can, can easily be accessible. But I think it's it's about really utilizing them in a proper way. Yeah, excellent. We'll do one more if that's okay. Make it quick. Okay. Final egg. Final leg. Okay. Alrighty. <laughs> Let's see something exciting comes up. Agile. Agile. <laughs> a sigh from Sanjeev as Agile comes No, Agile is, I mean, yeah, I mean, everybody's talking about Agile, so yeah, go on. Are, is everyone still talking about Agile, do you think? Um, 
I think people are still talking about agile. I mean, obviously, you, you have to look at industries, right? So, I mean, my my clients are utilities clients, and they're still talking about agile, yeah. right? Like, I mean, uh, one of the clients I'm working with, they're, they're like a very slow adopter in agile, and now they want to become an agile-driven organization, right? And then on the other and other end of the spectrum, there are companies which are basically trying to um, um, move to, um, let's say, completely organizing themselves in agile teams and everything else, right? So, you know, you know some are early adopters, some are more mature organizations. So I think yeah, people are still trying to move towards Agile, but as, as I said, Agile is a much bigger thing rather than just like a doing a project in an Agile fashion, yeah. right? Because people, there's a lot of hype again on Agile. Um, you know, I've had clients which, which kind of say, oh, we, we, we're adopting Agile. But actually, you know, it's just that team which is adopting Agile with everything, or, or the whole ecosystem is like completely like yeah. hardcore waterfall or whatever <laughs> you want to call it. And then and then they don't even have the right governance around it. They don't have the right people who are actually empowered to take decisions and then it's a complete utter failure. So that's the kind of thing, right, we are struggling with. It's like, you know, there's a lot of Agile kind of thinking uh, which has been coming through, but it actually a very few kind of large organizations are delivering Agile at scale. What, what do you think is the agile of the future? Do you think it will continue to be something that is um, a methodology used fairly frequently or do you think there are going to be new methodologies that ar arise and knock agile out of the park? What do you think? I think there would be always change, right? I mean, I can't yeah. say there will be no new methodologies. I think there will be new methodologies that will drive agile yeah. potentially out of the park. You'll take some of the best things of agile and then, yeah. do you know. How quickly do you think that will happen though? Like, what's your sort of thoughts on that? Um, I think pretty quickly, right? I mean, yeah. uh, because I mean, the thing is that the speed of change is, is amazing in terms of what we are seeing in terms of, you know, as, you, as we were just talking about, like, you know, platforms, for example. I mean, yeah. for me, it's like people are, if you now look at technology, I mean, my view is that, you know, there are three or four companies with like billion dollars investments going every year in terms of technology platforms and, and they are going to change the way, you know, development is going to work and how you're going to actually, you know, leverage some of those technology investments they're making and, and, and utilize them. So I think that'll change the way you want to deliver projects again. Yeah. Right, and so so I think I think I, I don't think it's too far away. We have to always kind of constantly be on the on the move to say you know what is the best way to think about delivering a project, and and not be wedded to a particular methodology really. Yeah, I think that is um, yeah the most common way of thinking about it. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how uh, how things develop on that front. Sanji, thank you for your time today. Hope you enjoyed You're the chat. Thank you. Power up your day with the Bulletin Brief, the latest news, insights and opinion delivered straight to your inbox. Subscribe now at digitalbullet.in.